Su Excelencia, Presidente de la República de Chile, Mr. Sebastián Piñera y Tiniqui, and the President of the United States of America, His Excellency, President Barack Obama, are now entering the Patio de las Camellias. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to you all. Welcome to the joint press conference of the Presidents of Chile and of the United States. First, we will hear His Excellency, President of the Republic of Chile, Mr. Sebastián Piñera. Good afternoon, everyone. Firstly, I would like to cordially and heartily welcome a friend of Chile and a personal friend like President Obama. I think that his, your visit president is very important and has enormous significance for Chile. It's the first time in more than 20 years that a president of the United States visits our country. Of course, we've had several multilateral summits of world leaders, and this visit coincides with the celebration of 50 years of the Alliance for Progress that was announced by President Kennedy at the beginning of the 60s. We have had, with President Obama, a very open, frank, and fruitful conversation. And we have been able to subscribe many agreements of different nature, but they do have something in common. They all contribute to a better life and better quality of life for our peoples, like trade promotion and to accelerate and perfect the free trade agreements we have with the United States, cooperation in the field of education and English teaching as it, in order to make of Chile a bilingual country, collaboration in the development and efficient use of energies, and clean e energies in particular, renewable energies where Chile has enormous potential, and also collaboration in uh, research technologies and training of our engineers and technicians in nuclear energy. But I want to be very clear and adamant. Chile is not going to build, nor is it planning to build, any s nuclear power plant during our government during our administration. The idea of this agreement is that we may understand much better nuclear technologies to be able to train our engineers and technicians so that in the future we may make more informed decisions, more intelligent decisions protecting the health and life of our population, the environment, and nature, and also that will allow us to ensure that the operation of our two experimental nuclear power plants be fully, fully safe. Also, we have signed agreements to collaborate in natural disasters, in early warning mechanisms and effective aid and rescue of civil populations. We have much to learn from institutions like FEMA in the United States. Another agreement is something addressing the only renewable resource in, of modern times, science, technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship that we need to strengthen in our country so as to reach the development stage that we are seeking. And then finally, agreements to better protect our nature, our environment. I want to tell you, President Obama, that when you announce your visit to Chile, Brazil, and El Salvador, on the occasion of the State of the Union Address, you said you were coming to forge new partnerships for the progress of the Americas. And you said that throughout all the world, you were committed to those countries that assume their responsibilities. Frankly, I think that Chile has assumed and will continue to assume its responsibility with our fate, with our region, with our country, and to the extent possible, with the rest of the world. And as we have been able to evidence in our conversations, not only today, but also in your country and in Asia, we have discovered that our two nations have a road of collaboration that can be built on rock and not on sand, because we coincide in that which is key, 
the values, the principles, the visions that facilitates the road. And with that, we can convincingly embrace this new alliance, this new partnership between the United States of America and the rest of the American countries. We are all Americans, an alliance that should be much deeper and, and forward-looking than the Alliance for Progress. And this partnership, this alliance, is one of our times of our 21st century of the society of information and technology. President Obama, Chile has set for itself an ambitious goal before the end of this decade to leave underdevelopment behind, to defeat poverty, and to build a society of opportunities and assurance for all of its sons and daughters, and also to achieve a strong alliance among equals with the same rights, obligations, of Latin America with the United States, and this is going to be very powerful, very useful in many fields. Promotion of world peace, perfectioning of democracy, rule of law, and defense of human rights, but also in economic integration, when, where Chile aspires to accelerate, perfect, and deepen our free trade agreement with the United States. Also, uh, we would like to raise our voice to ask for countries like Colombia and Panama also to have free trade agreements with your country and may join in this Trans-Pacific Partnership Initiative. It's going to be a free trade uh, area in both sides of the Pacific Ocean and where we will find the largest free trade market in the world. Also, we are concerned about the delays and tensions of the Doha round. I know that the United States is going to make efforts for this to to move forward. And then, on the other hand, I would like to raise uh, to you a much closer collaboration in the field of science, technology, innovation, and undertaking. Uh, because in modern times, free trade has to be not only of goods, but of ideas. Not only of services, but of knowledge. Not only of investments, but also of technology. And also, Mr. President, we are committed in the struggle against poverty and excessive inequalities in our country, in our continent. We want to keep on collaborating with the U.S. so as to contribute to other Latin American countries. Just like we can learn from them, they can learn from success stories in our country. And in combating the evils of, so, so, of modern society, fight against uh, drug trafficking, terrorism, global warming, and the proliferation of massive destruction weapons and nuclear weapons. I was talking with President Obama in so far as uh, avoiding this nuclear menace. But it's not only that a few countries in the world will have nuclear weapons and others not, but to have a world without weapons of mass destruction. This is the common goal we share with President Obama and with all the men and women of goodwill of all of the world. President of Obama, I have read with great attention your words in El Cairo, Egypt, for the Arab world, where you proposed a new beginning in the relations between the United States and the Islam world. And also your words in Akagana, where you raised a new commitment, a new promise, a new commitment with the sub-Saharan African world. And today that the winds of freedom, of democracy, Democracy, of participation and protection of human rights are stronger than ever, even in those countries that had never had not existed in, for many years. This is a great opportunity to have a new alliance between the United States and the Latin American countries. That is why I would like to tell you that Latin America is more prepared than ever today so as to leave poverty and underdevelopment behind that have been with us for 200 years of independent life and undertake the adventure of the future of democracy, of freedom, of development, of equality of opportunities, that we may have a continent, as we have dreamt it always, from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego, from the Pacific to the Atlantic Ocean, that will become a land of freedom, of opportunities, of progress, but also also a, a land of fairness and camaraderie. 
as dreamt by the founding fathers of that great nation like, of the, like the United States, like the case of Jefferson, a great patriot like Lincoln, but also like San Martin and O'Higgins from our continent. And the question is a very straightforward one, a very simple one. It's our challenge, it's our mission, the mission of the generation of the bicentennial. Because if it's not now, then when? If we are not the ones, then who? Then President Obama, we are listening with great attention, with great interest, the message you will deliver in a few hours from the cultural center of La Moneda to the Latin America and to the whole world. Thank you very much. We thank the words of the President of the Republic of Chile, Mr. Sebastián Piñera Echenique. Now we will hear the President of the United States, His Excellency, Mr. Barack Obama. Thank you very Obama. much, uh, President uh, Piñera. Buenas tardes uh, to everyone here. Uh, I, I want to first of all just uh, extend my greetings uh, to the people of Chile. Uh, and uh, I am so grateful for the, not only the generous words, but also the outstanding hospitality that's being shown to me, uh, as well as my family. Uh, I want to begin today by noting that uh, President Pineda and I discussed some urgent events unfolding around the world. Together with our partners, the United States is taking military action to enforce UN Security Council Resolution 1973 and protect the Libyan people. Across the region, we believe that the legitimate aspirations of people must be met and that violence against civilians is not the answer. And across the Pacific, both Chile and the United States are supporting the Japanese people as they recover from the catastrophic earthquake and tsunami and address the situation in their damaged nuclear facility. These events remind us that in our interconnected world, the security, and prosperity of nations and peoples are intertwined as never before. And no region is more closely linked than the United States and Latin America. And here in the Americas, one of our closest and strongest partners is Chile. Chile is one of the great success stories of this region. It's built a robust dem uh, democracy. It's been one of the most open and fastest growing economies in the world. The spirit and resilience of the Chilean people, especially after last year's earthquake, have inspired people across the globe. And in my speech this afternoon, I look forward to paying tribute to Chile's progress and the lessons it offers as America forges a new era of partnership across the Americas. I was proud to welcome President Pineda to Washington last year for our nuclear security summit. Mr. President, I want to commend you on your decisive leadership uh, in these first uh, few months of office, in the first year of office, uh, a time that's been uh, obviously very uh, difficult and has tested uh, the people of Chile. I want to thank you for the focus and energy that you've brought to the partnership between our two countries, which we have strengthened today. We're moving ahead with efforts to expand trade and investment, as uh, the President mentioned. Under our existing trade agreement, trade between the United States and Chile has more than doubled, creating new jobs and opportunities in both our countries. But I believe, and President Panetta believes, that there's always more we can do to expand our economic cooperation. So today we recommitted ourselves to fully implementing our free trade agreement to include protections of intellectual property so our businesses can innovate and stay competitive. We agreed to build on the progress we're making towards a trans-Pacific partnership so we can seize the full potential of trade in the Asia-Pacific, especially for our small and medium businesses. And it's my hope that, along with our other partners, we can reach an agreement on the framework for the TPP by the end of this year, an agreement that can serve as a model for the 21st century. We're expanding the clean energy partnerships that are key to creating green jobs and addressing climate change, which is evident in the glacier melt in this region. As a member of the Energy and Climate Partnership for the Americas that I proposed, Chile is already sharing its expertise with solar with the region. I want to commend President Pineda for uh, agreeing to take another step, hosting a new center to address glacier melt in the Andes. In addition, a new U.S.-Chile Energy Business Council 
will encourage collaborations between our companies in areas like energy efficiency and renewable technologies. Our governments have agreed to share our experience in dealing with natural disasters, an area, of course, where Chile has enormous expertise and which is critical to recovery and economic reconstruction. The President and I discussed our shared commitment to expanding educational exchanges among our students who can learn from each other and bring our countries even closer together. And in my speech today, I'll announce an ambitious new initiative to increase student exchanges between the United States and Latin America, including Chile. Now, even as we deepen cooperation between our two countries, I want to take this opportunity to commend Chile for the leadership role that it's increasingly playing across the Americas. Chile is a vital contributor to the United Nations mission in Haiti, where we agree that yesterday's election is an opportunity to accelerate recovery and reconstruction efforts. And the Chilean legislature recently passed strong legislation to combat the scourge of human trafficking. Under President Pineda's leadership, Chile is taking a new step today. Mr. President, I want to thank you for offering to share Chile's security expertise with Central American nations as they fight back against criminal gangs and narco-traffickers. Uh, I'm also pleased that our two governments will be working together to pr uh, promote development in the Americas. At the same time, Chile is assuming more of a leadership role beyond the Americas. As part of last year's Nuclear Security Summit, Chile took the bold step of giving up its stockpile of highly enriched uranium. Chile is the first Latin American nation to join a new international effort to strengthen civil society groups that are under threat. And as a member of the UN Human Rights Council, Chile has joined with us in standing up against human rights abuses in Iran and in Libya. In short, Mr. President, uh, today we've proven again that when the United States and Chile work together in a spirit of mutual interest and mutual respect, it's not only good for the peoples of our nations, I believe it's good for the region and it's good for the world. And I'm confident that our partnership will only grow stronger in the years to come, and I'm very much uh, grateful for the wonderful hospitality that you're showing uh, me and my delegation. Thank you very much. We thank the words of the President of the United States. Now we will proceed to the questions from the media. We remind you that only three questions will be allowed, and they have been decided on. One from Chile, one from international. The first question is Rodrigo Vergara, on behalf of the Association of Journalists from La Moneda. President Piñera, President Obama, good afternoon. President Obama, you have emphasized and highlighted the economic uh, management of Chile, the leadership in the region, those were your words, and even the, uh, the successful transitioning to democracy in the difficult years of the 90s. However, in Chile, President Obama, there are some open wounds of the dictatorship of General Pinochet. And so, in that sense, leaders, political leaders, leaders of the world, of human rights, even MPs, the son of the murdered Orlando Letelier foreign minister, have said that many of those wounds have to do with the United States. I ask you, justice is uh, investigating cases of Allende and the death of President Eduardo Frei Montalva. In that new speech that you will announce, is it in, do you include that the U.S. is willing to collaborate with those judicial investigations, even that the United States is willing to ask for forgiveness for what it did in, th in those very difficult years in the 70s in Chile? Well, uh, on the specific question of how we can work with the Chilean government, uh, any requests that are made uh, by Chile uh, to obtain more information about the past uh, is something that uh, we will certainly consider and we would like to cooperate. Uh, I think it's very important for all of us to know our history. Uh, you know, and obviously, the history of relations between the United States and Latin America uh, have at times been extremely rocky uh, and have at times been difficult. I think it's important, though, for us even as we understand our history and gain uh, clarity about our history, that we're not trapped by our history. 
And the fact of the matter is, is that uh, over the last two decades, we've seen extraordinary progress here in Chile. Uh, and that has not been impeded by the United States, but in fact has been fully supported by the United States. Uh, so uh, I can't speak to all of the policies of the past. I can speak certainly to the policies of the present and the future. Uh, and as President of the United States, what I know is that our firm commitment to democracy, our firm commitment uh, to era eradicating poverty, our full commitment to broad-based and socially inclusive development, uh, our full support of the robust uh, open markets that have developed here uh, in Chile and uh, the work that uh, President Pineda and his predecessor, President uh, Bachelet, uh, have done uh, in order to uh, transform uh, the economic situation here. Those are all things that the United States strongly supports. Uh, and so, uh, again, it's important for us to, to learn from our history, to understand our history, uh, but not be trapped by it, uh, because we've got a lot of challenges now and even more importantly, we have challenges uh, in the future uh, that we have to attend to. The second question is by Jim Cooner from the Associated Press. Mr. President, Senator Presidente, muchas gracias. Uh, sir, how do you square your position uh, that Colonel Gaddafi has lost legitimacy and, uh, and must go? against the uh, limited objective of this campaign, uh, which does not demand his removal. If uh, Colonel Gaddafi is killing his own people, is, uh, is it uh, permissible to let him stay in, in power? And if I may add, uh, do, you, do you have uh, any regrets, sir, about undertaking this, this mission while you're in foreign soil? And uh, do, you have, uh, do you have the support of uh, the Arab people in this yet? Okay. Uh, First of all, I think I'm going to embarrass Jim by uh, letting everyone know that uh, Jim's mother is Chilean. Uh, and, uh, and so this is a little bit of a homecoming. You were born in Chile, am I yes, right? Yes, sir. It's a delight to be here. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, so I, I thought everybody should know that. Um, and also, uh, I think that for all the uh, Chilean press, uh, you don't need to take Jim's example by asking three questions, uh, <laughs> pretending it's one. One uh, subject. <laughs> The, uh, uh, first of all, uh, I think it's very easy to square our military actions and our stated policies. Uh, our military action is in support of an international uh, mandate from the Security Council that specifically focuses on the humanitarian threat posed by Colonel Gaddafi to his people. Not only was he carrying out uh, murders of civilians, but he threatened more. He said very specifically, we will show no mercy uh, to uh, people who lived in Benghazi. Uh, and in the face of that, the international community rallied and said, we have to stop uh, any potential atrocities inside of Libya, uh, and provided a broad mandate to accomplish that specific task. Uh, as part of that international coalition, I authorized the United States military to work uh, with our international partners to fulfill that mandate. Now, I also have stated that it is U.S. policy that Gaddafi needs to go. And we've got a wide range of tools in addition to our military efforts to support that policy. We were very rapid in initiating unilateral sanctions and then helping to mobilize international sanctions against uh, the Gaddafi regime. Uh, we froze assets uh, that Gaddafi might have used to uh, further empower himself and uh, purchase weapons or hire mercenaries that might be directed against the Libyan people. Uh, so there are a whole range of policies that we are putting in place that has created uh, one of the most powerful uh, international uh, consensuses around the isolation of uh, Mr. Gaddafi, and we will continue to pursue those. But when it comes to our military action, we are doing so in support of UN Security Resolution uh, 1973 that specifically talks about humanitarian efforts, 
uh, and we are going to make sure that we stick to that mandate. Uh, I think it's also important, uh, since we're on the topic, that I have consistently emphasized uh, that because we're working with international partners, uh, after the initial thrust that has disabled uh, Gaddafi's air defenses, uh, limits his ability to uh, threaten uh, large population centers like Benghazi, uh, that there's going to be a transition taking place in which we have a range of coalition partners, uh, the Europeans, members uh, of the Arab League, who will then be participating in establishing a no-fly zone there. Uh, and so there's going to be a transition taking place in which we are one of the partners among many uh, who are going to ensure that that no-fly zone is in force and that uh, the humanitarian uh, protection that needs to be provided continues to be in place. Um, with respect to uh, initiating uh, this action while I was uh, abroad, uh, keep in mind that we were working on very short time frames. Uh, and we had done all the work and it was just a matter of seeing how Gaddafi would react to the warning that I issued on Friday. Uh, he, despite uh, words to the contrary, was continuing to act aggressively towards his civilians. After consultation with our allies, we decided to move forward. Uh, and it was a matter of me uh, directing uh, Secretary of Defense uh, Gates and Admiral Mullen uh, that the plan that had been developed in great detail, extensively, prior to my departure, was put into place. Um, Jim, I've, I've forgotten if there were any other elements of that question, but I've tried to be as Arab, thorough as possible. Arab support, sir. Uh, well, look, uh, the Arab League uh, specifically uh, called for uh, a no-fly zone before we went to the United Nations, and that was, I think, an important element uh, in this overall campaign. But w will they be part of the, of the mission? Absolutely. Uh, uh, we, we, are, we are in consultations as we speak. As I said, there are different phases to the campaign. The initial campaign, we took a larger role because we've got some unique capabilities. Uh, our ability to take out, for example, Gaddafi's air defense systems uh, are uh, much more significant than some of our other partners. What that does then is it creates the space, it shapes the environment in which a no-fly zone can actually be effective. It was also important to make sure that uh, we got in there quickly so that whatever uh, advances were being made on Benghazi uh, could be halted and we could send a clear message to Gaddafi uh, that uh, he needed to start pulling his troops back. Um, now, keep in mind, we've only been uh, in this process for two days now. Uh, and so uh, we are continuing to evaluate the situation on the ground. I know that the Pentagon and uh, our Defense Department will be briefing you extensively uh, as this proceeds. But, but the core principle that has to be upheld here is that when the entire international community, almost unanimously, says that there is a potential humanitarian crisis about to take place, that a leader who has lost his leg legitimacy decides to turn his military on his own people, uh, that we can't simply stand by uh, with empty words. Uh, that we have to take uh, some sort of action. Uh, I think it's also important to note that uh, the way that the U.S. took leadership and managed this process ensures international legitimacy and ensures that our partners, members of the international coalition, are uh, bearing the burden of uh, following through on the mission as well. Because, as you know, there, in the past, there have been times where the United States acted unilaterally or did not have full international support. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, typically, it was the United States military that ended up bearing the entire burden. Now, last point I'll make on this. I could not be prouder of the manner in which the uh, U.S. military has uh, performed uh, over the last several days. Uh, and it's a testament to the men and women in uniform uh, who, when they're given a mission, they execute. Uh, and do an outstanding job. But uh, obviously our military is already very stretched uh, and carries large burdens all around the world. And whenever possible for us to be able to get international cooperation, uh, not just in terms of words, but also in terms of planes and pilots and resources, uh, that's something that we should actively seek uh, and embrace. 
uh, because it relieves the burden on our military and it re uh, relieves the burden on U.S. taxpayers to fulfill what is an international mission and not simply a U.S. mission. Thank you, sir. Senor Presidente, si, si me, si puedo preguntarle. Uh, Mr. President, uh, can I ask you, I will ask you in English. To um, answer the, uh, the, to the response that uh, the President gave regarding the, the wounds that still linger in this country and uh, the, the needs that some of the, the people in this country want for uh, an apology from the United States, perhaps, and certainly for assistance in, uh, in any investigations that are still ongoing uh, here. Thank you. The uh, coup d'etat was in Chile, existed in Chile 40 years ago. We had a long and profound conversation with President Obama. We didn't have much time to cover all the issues of the future, so we didn't go so back in the, into the past. But I can tell you that Chile, our government, and this president believes, firmly believes in the self-determination of peoples and firmly believes in the rule of law and respect for human rights. For that reason, when we had uh, evidence uh, that in the case of President Frei Montalva there could have been a homicide, our government submitted a claim, a complaint, is party to it, and it's collaborating to find, to investigate those responsible for the death of the former president, Frei Montalva. And once the judiciary ascertains those responsibilities, they will have to assume the penalties and punishment according to our rule of law. In the case of President Allende, we don't have the same basis, but if we had them, we would act exactly in the same way and or the same presumptions. And I would like to say finally that today the subject of democracy, of human rights, has no borders, does not recognize any border, and that is progress of this 21st century civilization. And that is why Chile supports the initiative of the United Na Nations through its Security Council, NATO, and the Arab League to do all that is possible to end a true carnage, killing of civilians in Libya. And I think that is a responsibility of the international community because, as I said a while ago, human rights do not and should not respect borders. The responsibility is of all of us in each and every place of the world, whatever the circumstances invoked to violate human rights. And in my view, a person that has bombarded his own people does not deserve to keep on being the ruler of that people. The last question of this uh, conference will be by Macarena Vidal from Spain. You ask the Chilean uh, press not to take advantage and uh, make a several part uh, question, but you didn't mention the international press. <laughs> uh, are you a lawyer or a journalist? <laughs> well, we try to be precise. <laughs> um, so, on Libya, when uh, you say that uh, you will be transferring command, uh, when, uh, when are you thinking of uh, transferring command, and uh, would NATO be the preferred partner to take over that command? And uh, the second part of the question is, uh, you have said that you want an alliance among equals with uh, the peoples of the Americas. What deliverables are you going to go for after this trip to achieve it? And, uh, Señor Presidente, uh, Señor Presidente Piñera, and Mr. President Piñera, what is the content of this partnership so as to meet the goals of the region? Well, uh, with respect to Libya, uh, obviously the situation is evolving on the ground, uh, and uh, how quickly this transfer takes place will be determined by uh, the recommendations of uh, our commanding officers. That the mission has been completed, the first phase of the mission has been completed. Uh, as I said, our initial focus is taking out uh, Libyan air defenses so that a no-fly zone can operate effectively uh, and aircraft and pilots of the coalition are not threatened uh, when they're uh, maintaining the no-fly zone. Uh, the second aspect of this is making sure that uh, 
the humanitarian uh, aspects of the mission uh, can be met. Uh, but let me emphasize that we uh, anticipate this transition to take place in a matter of days and not a matter of weeks. Uh, and so uh, I would expect that uh, you know, over the next several days uh, we'll have more information uh, and the Pentagon will be fully briefing uh, the American people uh, as well as the press uh, on that issue. Uh, NATO will be involved uh, in a coordinating function because uh, of the extraordinary capacity of that alliance. Uh, but I will leave it to Admiral Mullen uh, and uh, those who are directly involved in the operation uh, to uh, describe to you how exactly that transfer might, be, uh, might take place. Um, with respect to the, uh, this new partnership, I don't want to give you all my best lines from my speech, otherwise no one will come. Um, but uh, you know, the, the thing that uh, I'm most excited about is the fact that uh, in a country like Chile, uh, it's not just a matter of what we can uh, give to Chile, it's also a matter of what Ch Chile can offer us. Uh, Chile uh, has done some very interesting work around clean energy. So we set up a clean energy partnership. We think we're doing uh, terrific work on alternative energy sources, but uh, there may be initiatives that are taking place here in Chile that might be transferable to the United States. Uh, on education, uh, obviously uh, we have uh, a long history of public education and, and uh, our universities, uh, I think, are second to none. Uh, but uh, we want to make sure that in this in, uh, increasingly integrated world, uh, American students aren't just looking inwards, we're also looking outwards. And so the idea of us uh, setting up a broad-based uh, exchange program uh, with the Americas, I think, makes uh, an enormous difference. Security cooperation. Uh, you know, the, the, the plague of narco traffickers in the region uh, is something that we're all too familiar with. Uh, and obviously we have the example of uh, Colombia that has made great strides in bringing security to uh, a country that had been ravaged by drug wars. Um, what lessons can we take and then apply them to smaller countries in Central America, for example, that are going through some of these same struggles. For Chile, the United States, Colombia, other countries uh, to work in concert to help to train uh, effective uh, uh, security operations in Central America to deal with narco traffickers is uh, a kind of collaboration that uh, would not be as effective if the United States were operating uh, on its own. Uh, so I think across uh, the spectrum of issues that we care about deeply uh, and that Chile care about deeply, uh, what, will, what will characterize this new partnership uh, is the fact that it's a two-way street. Uh, uh, you know, th th this is not a, just a situation where uh, a highly developed country uh, is helping a poor and impoverished country. This is, is a situation where uh, an up-and-coming uh, regional power uh, that has a strong voice in international affairs uh, is now collaborating with us uh, to hopefully help uh, a, a greater peace and prosperity for the region and the world. No doubt that insofar as integration of the Americas, we are lagging behind. And the best way to illustrate this is to compare what has happened in America with what happened in Europe. Last century, the Europeans had two world wars that with a toll of more than 70 million casualties. But at some point, they had the wisdom, the courage, to abandon the la rationale of Line Maginot or Siegfried or Line and to embrace the Master Maastricht uh, Treaty with the leadership and the vision of such a renowned uh, statesmen like Adenauer, De Gaspiere, Hausmann, Truman. They began to build what today we know of 
uh, us, European Union. And uh, in America, we are much behind that. In America, 20 years ago, President Bush's father raised the idea of a free trade area from Alaska to Fireland, generating a lot of enthusiasm in the region, but it never came true, never materialized. And so the time is right now because Latin America has been for too long the continent of hope or of the future. But a continent cannot be a promise forever. And so we are of age now, and we need to fulfill our mission. Therefore, the main task of Latin America is to recover the lost time and tap all of its potential. We have lots of things in common with the US, vast, generate, generous territory, homogeneous people, work, hardworking people. We don't have racial problems that affect some African countries or the wars that, uh, waged in Europe, nor the religious conflicts of Europe itself. And therefore, Latin America is called to uh, compromise or rather commitment with its own faith. And therefore, we are looking forward to President Obama's words. We are all left-handed. We have many coincidences. We studied in Harvard, both of us. We are sportsmen. President Obama continues to be a basketball player. I was in my time as well. I think the first lady of the US is very good looking and President Obama has said the same about the first lady of Chile. There are plenty of coincidences, but the most important one is the one we'll find this afternoon. And modestly, if I could suggest to President Obama, we hope to have a partnership that it's two dot O. A one where we have all responsibilities and not an assistentialist alliance because assistentialism has never been enough to face the major problems, but rather a partnership of collaboration between Latin America and the United States sharing values, principles, and a common vision. And that alliance should be comprehensive. It to, it, it should reach out to the fields of democracy, freedom, rule of law, defense of human rights. And I think that we have to improve the Democratic Charter of OAS. It should also open up the doors to the free trade of goods and services, and faster than what we have done hitherto. And in addition to that, to include those subjects which are the two pillars of the 21st century, quality of education, science, technology, innovation, entrepreneurship. Therein lie the pillars for Latin America so as to leave poverty and underdevelopment behind. And we have so much to learn from a country like the United States that in its 230 years of independent life has really a, a, gave has given true evidence of being a, an innovative country and that has made the largest contribution to progress of mankind. And thus, Latin America and the United States have a lot to gain from this alliance. That also has to reach out to two of the most important challenges of the 21st century, energy, to have clean, safe, renewable energies, and water, if global warming keeps on going, could be the most scarce resource of our century, and also face the major problems of modern society that cannot be faced unilaterally, organized crime, terrorism, drug trafficking, global warming, the subject of world security. It can no longer be faced individually. We need to work jointly together. And in our view, that will call for a new international order that will replace that which emerged in Bretton Woods after the Second World War and to be appropriate and adapted to the needs and challenges of the 21st century, where the only constant thing we have is change. So the time is right to recover all that loss time and time is here so that finally this relationship of encounters disencounters of shaking hands or our backs for that to be in the past and let us initiate a new era collaboration re-encountering frankly effectively concretely that will truly face and solve 
the major problems that will also open up the doors to tap the main opportunities. This society of knowledge and information is knocking on our doors. Latin America is, was late to the Industrial Revolution. We cannot be late in this tremendous revolution, which is so much deeper, which is that of knowledge and information. As, and it has been very generous, very generous with the countries that want to embrace it, but very cruel cool with those countries that do not tap it. No child should be left behind. I've heard this from President Obama. And here we say in Latin America, no country should be left behind. Thank you.